depression. Despite being exhausted and mentally drained by a 15 month long war, it has been a battle all these months. And I think we are encouraged as South Africans, we celebrate you as healthcare practitioners, as healthcare workers, the frontline staff that really have kept us um, alive, have given us hope um, in the most difficult times when we listen to stories from individuals who've shared in the social media platforms everywhere, in our families, in our workplace, who continue to say good things about the healthcare workers who gave them hope in the most difficult times. But again, we dip our banners to those that fell in the line of duty. We honor them and we recognize them. Ladies and gentlemen, it brings me comfort, therefore, to know that our healthcare workers are protected. The vast majority have been vaccinated, and we have adequate staff, sorry, adequate stock in terms of our PPE. And thanks to the generous donation of multilateral organizations um, such as a Global Fund, but also the Solidarity Fund that has helped us, it is also important to acknowledge the close working relationship between the National Treasury and our department, the Department of Health, to ensuring adequate funding for the PPEs and a sound stock visibility system, which allows not only our officials to monitor the PPE stock, but where occupational health and safety representatives and union members have also been granted access to be able to monitor this. In this regard, PPEs are managed by a collective that puts the safety of our value to health care workers at the top of the agenda. We know that the current wave is largely driven by the surge in Gauteng. Yesterday, the province recorded 9,501 new cases, accounting for 59% of the new cases. The next most affected province is Western Cape, at 12% of new cases on the same day. The seven-day moving average graph now clearly shows that in Gauteng, this wave has passed the first two waves, as we said in our last briefing. Therefore, we should, and also we are saying to the provinces, other provinces, that they should not have a sense of complacency because what we are seeing in terms of the numbers is a demonstration of an up upward trajectory. And it is inevitable that the wave in Houghton will spill over into the rest of the country. It is important to remember that as previously announced, the National Department of Health have activated, actually has developed a team um, that works together with, uh, put together a team that works together with WHO, which is a search team that is here, assisting us to manage the pandemic. And also the development of a practical guide for the provincial health departments, outlining the steps that should be followed on how to respond to COVID-19. And this was done after the second wave, understanding and taking lessons from both the first and the second wave. Just to highlight that, the strategy contains or the plan contains 10 interventions that the provinces need to follow or implement and look into that in terms of preparations and responses. The first area is around governance and leadership. The second area is medical supplies. Third area is port and environmental health. The fourth area, epidemiology and response. The next one, facility and readiness in terms of making sure that the institutions such as your uh, hospitals and all that, they are having beds and all that. Case management, where we're monitoring the numbers and how we're dealing with them. Risk communication and community engagement. This is the part that is important because also as communities who are listening, your response in this area, because as you are engaged, you can only work and have your response in it. Occupational health and safety as well in terms of our environment, like environments as well. Infection, prevention and control, and human resources for our health. Each intervention area and action items have been identified specifically for each level of infection. From the department, national department, we also monitor the following in terms of key parameters that relate to the, sorry, that relates to the pandemic. 
Firstly, it's around the daily infection rate as we report in terms of the infection numbers. The admission rates monitored in terms of the hospital's admission rates, the mortality rates, the oxygen availability, and working together with suppliers to ensure that there isn't a shortage of oxygen in the country. PPE availability, which I respond I, earlier on related to, medicine availability. Where there are challenges, we also alert the provinces to the impeding risk and encourage them to address the matters. Yesterday, as National Department, we held a meeting with the Houghton Department of Health, a bilateral meeting that went into the details to look at what confronts the province in terms of the pressure that they are facing with this wave and comprehensively finding areas and dealing with the drivers of this current wave, dealing with the strategic case management and effective containment measures. I will be also meeting with the MEC on COVID-19 tomorrow following an advisory, which they have already provided, which has been sent to me, in terms of what are the critical areas that they are raising and the interventions that we need to be able to make as national government and also the provinces. We have also asked Dr. M. M. Ben Bile, who's here in the panel, to try and assist us in terms of the work that is being done, detailing the national and provincial implementation in terms of the response of the search on the strategies. We had hoped that we will have a representative of the province of Gauteng so that they can be able to participate in this briefing to give us from their own view and give hope in terms of the province, how they're managing the pandemic. But you would have had, the premier yesterday had a briefing where he detailed based following his um, uh, budget in the province, where he detailed the plans and what they are doing and the advices that they've been able to receive from the advisory panel. Also yesterday, I joined Minister Mbalula and Minister Nchaibeni on compliance monitoring in Swami. And I think what I need to highlight is that we need, to, it's important for all of us to continue to not only wearing the mask or following the necessary uh, non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions, but I think what is more important for us is that even when we wear the mask, we must wear the mask full, actually all the time in public, but also wearing them correctly. I think most of the people will have their mask in their pockets, but others will actually wear their mask, but not wear their mask correctly. So this, as part of we do, what we do monitoring, we want to urge as well South Africans to help us in monitoring each other, but alerting each other in terms of the risk that we face. On the vaccine rollout, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to highlight that part of the search response is accelerating, accelerating the vaccine rollout. I'm encouraged that we have passed the 2 million mark for the national rollout campaign and that we have now vaccinated a total in almost around 2.5 million as of yesterday, five o'clock. The program for the educator, education sector began on Wednesday, and I must congratulate the provinces together with the Department of, of edu Basic Education, together with Minister Musaka for vaccinating nearly around 50,000 a day for the past two days. At this rate, we will be able to finish the sector by 10, uh, within 10 days as we hoped. I do acknowledge that there are educators in the early childhood development sector and also post school system who fell left out when this program started. And I showed them that work is underway with both the Department of Social Development and Department of Higher Education, Science and Innovation for their rollout plan. The sector, oper this sector operates differently from basic education and it was not practically possible to include them as part of the basic education sector program. The vaccination of the education sector has pushed our daily vaccination numbers beyond the 100,000 mark. And we are really pleased about this. And with the anticipated flow of vaccine to come, we are now confident that we will be building towards the 300,000 daily mark target that the president has set for us. I must say, ladies and gentlemen, we are still worried about the demand from the 60 plus popular age population group, which has continued to decrease. And as a group that is most at risk, we cannot give up on netting the vast majority of this group. We understand that this manifestation is a, it, it, the manifestation is as a result of combination of high 
vaccine hesitancy in this group, difficulties in accessing the technology to register, and as well the vaccination centers that are not easily accessible as part of the feedback we have received. We are now finalizing the plans to take vaccines to the people to ensure that we find all our senior citizens and vaccinate them for their own protection and to reduce the burden on the healthcare system. And as we indicated in the last briefing, learning out of what Limpopo province have been doing, the IMC on vaccine this week approved that provincial health department must drive what we call coordinated walk-ins to cater for this category of the population where necessary so that we can be able to see them registering and vaccinating in terms of the numbers that we are targeting and meeting the targets that we are looking for. Furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, evidence has emerged that the vaccination reduces transmission. On 23rd June 2021, the New England Journal of Medicines issued a highly anticipated publication showing significant reduction in transmission in households where there were vaccinated household members compared to households where no one was vaccinated. It even showed that the benefit was seen even if the household members only had one out of two vaccines. Professor Perushup, Chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on Vaccine, is here to explain these findings further and give us the background in terms of science. And also what is important for us, ladies and gentlemen, to highlight this is because, sorry, for us to highlight this is very critical because when you vaccinate, it tells us that it reduces the chances of passing the virus to your loved ones and that you, are that you are close to. And I hope this study, as is explained later, would motivate, especially as senior citizen, but those who have, doubt, have had doubts about this vaccine run out, to really take the opportunity and actually get vaccinated. I'm pleased also to announce that the IMC on vaccine approved that from the 1st of July, 2021, we will open registrations for, for all citizens which are between the ages of 50 years and above. And we will also schedule those vaccination to begin on the 15th of July. I encourage all the citizens to register and get their vaccine. If you have a friend, a family member, a neighbor, or a loved one who is at 60 years and above, especially as senior citizens who are battling to get a move around in terms of mobility, please bring them along in terms of your vaccination centers so that you can help them. And we are hoping that in the families, this will encourage all of us to take our parents, our grandparents, our loved ones, as we go to the vaccination sites in terms of those categories that are open. Ladies and gentlemen, it is important as well to explain in terms of the supply side of the vaccine. But so far, Pfizer has delivered nearly 4.5 million doses as promised in quarter two. They have also committed just over 15.5 million doses in quarter three, of which we are expecting nearly 2.1 million doses in July. Johnson & Johnson have so far delivered 500,000 early access doses used for Sisonke, 300 mark market doses last week, and 1.2 million doses landed last night in the afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. These doses all need to be used by 11 of August, and I think we are in tr on track in terms of working um, to ensure that we utilize these doses. But we are awaiting confirmation for delivery of 500 doses, um, and this then will make up 2 million to replace those that were affected in terms of the contamination um, that we announced last, last time. With this flow of vaccine, we will be able to press ahead with the vaccination of frontline workers, sector by sector. And I do want to confirm that we will then move on to workplace vaccination, both formal and informal sectors like the taxi industry. We will take guidance from the IMC on COVID-19, together with the MEC, on which of the sectors to prioritize and moving along until all work-based work, work vaccination are completed. So in summary, we are running three parallel processes in phase two as per our overall strategy. The first uh, uh, process is the general population registration and vaccination. 
The second one is priority services sector vaccination and workplace vaccination in key economic sectors. And Dr. Nicholas Cripps will also come in later and provide final details on how these programs will be run. Before I close, I just want to touch on two concerns which members of the public have raised and also um, indicate that on the issues of Sisonke trials, as Professor Gray outlined in the last press briefing, although the study results have not yet been concluded, preliminary results show clear evidence of reduced, moderate to severe illnesses and death in the vaccine, vaccinated cohort, which in this case was healthcare workers. There is clear evidence that vaccine will work. So far, so far, there are no deaths recorded related to the vaccine itself. And I think this was asked during the week, even when I did interviews. There were a few vaccine-induced thrombotic events, which were all very well detected and managed by our expert clinicians. Overall, this study provides confidence that the vaccine confers high levels of protection to those who have been inoculated, inoculated with it. And just, I hope it does give clarity in the issues that have been raised previously. The second concern I want to touch on is that of Pfizer and reports of heart inflammation in young men. These events are rare and Pfizer has decided to include this as a warning in the product label. I've been reassured by our experts that the vast majority, if not all cases, that have been reported were mild with short hospital stays and that there have been no reports in South Africa of such cases. We will, of course, watch the space closely when we vaccinate large numbers of the general population in those younger age groups. Pfizer is still considered safe and effective for all population groups above the age of 12 years. Professor Shoup will also touch on this later when he speaks. Lastly, I wish to address the issue of COVAX and our position as a country in response to the recent developments that were announced. We believe that COVAX is still a very useful facility for low and middle income countries. For South Africa, we'll continue to ensure that we get the best out of COVAX. However, we have adopted as well a diversity, diversified approach to procuring vaccine so that we do not put our eggs in one basket, as we have been false, falsely accused. As co-chairs of the ACT Accelerate, we continue to support the efforts of COVAX in securing vaccines for the less fortunate, particularly on the continent, and we therefore wish to ease any anxiety surrounding the dynamic mechanism of COVAX and reassure the nation that we remain in control of vaccine fortunes as a sovereign nation. Last night, the interaction and interactive dashboard for vaccines went live and Ms. Melanie Volmarans will do a short demonstration during the session as part of showcasing what the dashboard can do. And this is the first iteration of the interactive um, dashboard and will continue to be improved as we receive feedback from users. Now, finally, let me remind, uh, this reminds me to really request that South African residents please assist us. We are begging you, we are pleading with you. We can only do so much as government in terms of the fight against the pandemic. We request you to assist us in really building a capable state and also, but also a nation that is healthy, that is able to contribute meaningfully to its development. We can only do this when you help us in this fight of this pandemic. Help us as government, work with us together with the healthcare workers to be able to win this battle. We can only defeat this pandemic as we work together. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome now Minister Mutunu, who is going to take us through and deliver his remarks in terms of what we are doing in preparation for vaccination rollout in the public service. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Acting Minister of Health uh, in the Republic of South Africa. 
Um, I think we have uh, ministers, uh, acting ministers covered uh, quite a large ground uh, on uh, uh, the state of affairs in relation to vaccination in the country. I will uh, just make a few remarks uh, relating directly to public service. I just want to start by uh, um, acknowledging uh, the uh, the uh, Public Service Day um, by the United Nations, that is the 23rd of June every year, um, which serves to acknowledge um, the contribution and the role of public service and public servants in, in a society on a country by country basis, but uh, on a world stage. And also acknowledge uh, uh, the AU, um, acknowledge their own acknowledgement of public service and uh, public and public servants in our own continent uh, in Africa. We've just emerged from a, a three-day um, conference where in the focus was again on the role of public service and public servants throughout the continent and the world, but also uh, on a country by country basis. Indeed, all the world and the continent and in this case, ourselves, in our own country, South Africa, we acknowledge the role played by uh, uh, public servants and, and, and the whole of uh, public service, particularly uh, in periods of disaster uh, and hopelessness. And in this instance, uh, during these trying times of COVID in the Republic of South Africa in particular. When this disease attacked um, uh, us, um, we never thought that it would uh, uh, be so long um, and, and we would even by 21, 2021 June uh, be under the attack as is happening as uh, the acting minister has outlined particularly in relation with certain provinces uh, that are a, big, a bigger threat than others, especially in Gauteng. We, we got an the impression that um, uh, it would come and then go like all other diseases, uh, and uh, uh, let alone uh, pandemics, uh, which we had never experienced in our lives uh, at, this, at this level, countrywide and global. We therefore um, want to acknowledge that public services has uh, uh, played a critical role in assuring that public services in the country continue uh, right from national, from provinces, and from, um, uh, from local spheres of government. In particular, our acknowledgement goes to health workers, all of them in the health sector. We acknowledge uh, the role that they've, they've had to play, bringing hope uh, to our people throughout the Republic, but also ensuring that they could still put a smile in the face of uh, adversity, uh, that, uh, the kind that uh, our people have had to face all over. And indeed, um, uh, we've been briefing, we have been getting briefings from Department of Health uh, on a regular basis. And it's clear that uh, a, a lot of work has been done in the, in the process. We also uh, go on to acknowledge uh, educators uh, uh, in the education sector for the role they've played, uh, ensuring that uh, under these trying circumstances, education continued as a service uh, to young people throughout the Republic. Um, we also have to extend our sincere thanks to uh, policing services who have uh, kept uh, safety uh, measures on course uh, during these trying times. And of course, home affairs um, uh, workers. And I'm, I'm just talking about this four in particular 
but overall, all 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 uh, um, uh, public servants uh, in the various stations in the republic who acknowledge their own uh, very much. We are now in the age of um, um, employ uh, of uh, vaccinations, as the uh, acting minister has uh, uh, indicated. She has indicated uh, the figures close to 50,000 um, of educators alone. We would have uh, on our own uh, uh, as government, uh, but also particularly as public service, together with ministers that serve the public in, in this core public services, we would have loved that uh, the rollout would have happened uh, much earlier, uh, uh, considering that um, they are in the cold phase of uh, the pandemic, interacting with a large part, uh, a larger section of sections of uh, the populace in the Republic. Nevertheless, uh, there were delays uh, and the nation has been briefed from time to time um, on what was uh, being done to ensure that we have uh, vaccines and then uh, work on rollouts. We are happy finally that uh, um, a vaccine JNJ uh, has uh, finally arrived um, and, and it's now being rolled out throughout the Republic uh, for teachers. We would want uh, to plead with um, uh, those uh, who are responsible, the Department of Health, to make sure that we don't have any hitch, we just run smoothly. Uh, so that we extend the rollout to other uh, sections in the public service and cover everybody, including, uh, um, uh, I mean, all, all, all the, all this, all the, uh, said not just educators alone, not just those who, help, who work in the health sector alone, but everybody, literally everybody, and and we're sure on course uh, in that regard. We, we do have to acknowledge as well uh, a role played by uh, public servants in the other spheres of government uh, and, and, and the other arms of the state. They too uh, count as public servants, uh, even outside uh, the Public Service Act. They work for the public and were acknowledged to work, uh, magistrates, judges, and all of those people, but also people who work in parliaments and legislatures they have done a, um, a, a good job uh, making sure that uh, government uh, business uh, continues uh, unhampered. Of course, we need to acknowledge uh, in the public sphere the role GEMS has played. We've had, them, uh, we've had meetings with them um, and uh, um, we have uh, received briefings, startup briefings on their preparedness to work with uh, government departments to ensure the rollout of uh, uh, vaccinations. They've identified several sites and they have had uh, a number of meetings with provinces who are in provincial uh, premiers uh, or premiers have uh, uh, had uh, interactions with them and departments of health in various uh, uh, provinces. And they, they have worked together in identifying various sites in each of the provinces, and they've given them uh, plans, specific plans relating to how they will play their role in, in vaccinating. Of course, James, uh, um, uh, it caters for more than their direct uh, members, uh, the relatives of uh, direct members, and all of whom stand to benefit from what GEMS is doing, uh, currently working with the Department of Health closely as they've uh, had interactions and they're always on, 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 uh, on, on briefings together. So we acknowledge their role and we hope that all is going to go well. We need to also acknowledge the work of the private sector, uh, those that have uh, made a contribution in the rollout uh, of uh, uh, the vaccines and we're hoping that after having experienced uh, glitches of different kinds in the availability of uh, vaccines at different uh, periods we are now uh, we are now on course uh, to run uh, the uh, the rollout without any any problems 
uh, we, 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 we are hoping that uh, everybody acknowledges that the myth of uh, uh, that has been spread about vaccines has uh, um, by and large subsided. And it's clear now that uh, we all as a nation are convinced that uh, this is a, a, uh, the, the only decisive step that we can take against uh, uh, the uh, pandemic, against the virus itself that uh, we vaccinate, that uh, in the meantime, we uh, um, keep our masks tight uh, on our mouths and noses, and that we move on also with the cleaning of our hands on a regular basis, but almost also most particularly we ensure distancing, which uh, 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 all over the world is uh, are, are the uh, uh, the matters that are put to the public uh, uh, as a reminder that uh, uh, these are the best strategies to fight the disease. And at this stage, uh, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Minister. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to all that are involved here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, for those words. Um, I would now like to invite Dr. Anban Pile, as the minister outlined previously, to just take us through the surge response and to also just say uh, to members of the media that uh, the WhatsApp group for MLM Minister of Health is open, so you may send your questions and you may also send your questions to the chat box as well <clears throat> or to the Q&A section. Thank you very much, Dr. Pile. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Manzi. Good morning, uh, Ministers uh, Kubai and, uh, and uh, Nkunu, uh, Deputy Minister Pashla, DG, uh, Professor Shub and uh, Prof. Melissana and colleagues. Uh, I'm going to take you through the epidemiological trends and uh, plans of action to uh, mitigate against the current surge that we have uh, um, in the country. Uh, so I think uh, we 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 all recognize the, uh, the the spread of infection, but I thought this slide was important uh, in that it uh, highlights the uh, spread from week 22, and we're currently in week 24. And you can see the uh, the red areas in the graph, la largely in the inland provinces, spreading uh, um, across the country uh, to to mainly the inland provinces, but now moving into the Western Cape. Uh, although the uh, coastal provinces are, are largely spared, but I think this is a, a matter of time, as, as, as Minister Kubai was saying. Uh, in the Gauteng province, I think it's very clear that uh, uh, many of the, the, the districts are very much in the red, so uh, almost the entire province is uh, um, at high levels of infection and transmission, and so it's really important that we implement the non-pharmaceutical interventions as we move around if we have to. I think the the uh, percentage testing positive across the country, comparing them on a week by week basis, you can see that Gauteng has had the greatest increase aligned very much to the previous slide I showed you. But you see the Northwest is also showing uh, uh, significant increases on a week on week basis, as well as Mpumalanga and uh, uh, Limpopo. Um, the other provinces as well are showing increases, uh, uh, Western Cape as well, and KZN, although much lower levels, but certainly increases. The only province at this stage that seems to be fairly flat is the, is the Northern Cape. Uh, we also, from the uh, epidemiological uh, 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 consortium uh, dealing with modeling, have uh, 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 done forecasts on the number of new cases that we can anticipate in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and they continuously do this on a weekly basis. And their latest report provides us with a sense about what we can expect. The picture not very good in that uh, they anticipate that uh, across all of the nine provinces, we can expect increases, uh, some, uh, some variable in terms of the extent, but uh, quite large increases in some provinces like the Western Cape are predicted, Northwest as well, and the Eastern Cape. Um, but the only province at this stage that they're predicting uh, fairly uh, flat levels are uh, in the free state where it seems that uh, the, the, the spread may be stabilizing. Uh, this uh, forecast obviously then places pressure on the hospital beds uh, across the country. And <clears throat> we know that in Gauteng, uh, it's very much in the red zone. And you can see on the top right hand side, the uh, uh, graph relating to Gauteng, 
where the, the, the pressure on the beds is very significant. In addition to Gauteng, uh, uh, the Northwest and uh, uh, the Northern Cape are also having huge pressure on the beds at this stage. While the other provinces don't have the similar levels of, levels of pressure, uh, I think it's a, a matter of time as the uh, uh, cases increase that that's, this will happen. So we really need to make sure we implement the non-pharmaceutical interventions to prevent these admissions from of infections from occurring and consequently admissions into hospital where, when the, uh, um, the facilities are under pressure. So I think just in summary to, to, to quickly uh, reflect on, on, on where we are currently, we can see that nationally the numbers have increased on a week-on-week -week basis. This is driven largely by what's happening in Gauteng, which makes up about uh, two-thirds of the new cases in the past week. We've seen decreases in the Northern Cape and the Free State, and we hope that this continues because they've had sustained transmission for a while now. Uh, the percentage testing positive has continued to increase, uh, currently sitting at around 24%, meaning one in, in four people that are being tested are positive, when in, 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 uh, previously we had about one in 20 at one stage. So significant increases there. We've entered the third wave nationally, and uh, a number of provinces are within the third wave um, across the country. We've also had increased hospitalization across six of the uh, provinces in the country and increased deaths in four of those provinces. Coming now to our response in, to mitigate this, after the second wave, we had developed a plan to mitigate against the COVID-19 uh, resurgence uh, um, to, to anticipate this, the third wave and prepare the health facilities for this. We, we've done this and prepared a plan which identifies the key indicators to track resurgence and secondly to establish thre thresholds and metrics that uh, will alert us in any particular geographic area to the resurgence and the map that i showed you earlier uh, is aligned to these matrices um, we've we also provide guidance to provinces on the actions that need to be taken in order to respond to resurgence in a particular area uh, the minister has uh, uh, gone through this, but let me highlight just a few of the areas. There, there are 10 areas that we deal with here in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the toolkit uh, and our advisories to provinces as to what needs to happen. Medical supplies are critical, both PPE as well as medicines in order to respond to, to cases that come into hospital. Also the issues relating to port health and environmental health and making sure that we, our borders are secure in terms of testing and screening the epidemiological response around monitoring the cases, a laboratory turnaround times, information systems to share that information and make sure we're able to react. And very critical is our contact tracing and uh, um, community screening so that we can identify outbreaks and, and, and close those outbreaks down as soon as possible. Facility readiness as well as quarantine and isolation become as important and EMS needs to be activated in order to to respond to, to critical cases. The workplace and making sure that occupational health and safety uh, uh, is, is adhered to, so there's no spread in the workplace where that may happen. And, and as important and uh, uh, human resources for health here become critical to make sure we have as many hands on deck to be able to respond in our hospitals and clinics. So just to take you through some of the indices very quickly, um, in terms of the percentage of beds occupied by COVID-19 patients across the country, we monitored this on a week-on-week -week basis, and you can see Gauteng Northwest and the Northern Cape coming under the greatest pressure. The Western Cape is also increasing. Uh, the other provinces, if uh, the cases are not brought under control, will also show similar levels of, of, of increase. We also monitored the percentage of non-COVID uh, beds that have been occupied. And here again, the picture is no different from the previous Houting, Northwest, uh, the Northern Cape, and then the Western Cape showing increases um, uh, over the, the past couple of weeks. The ICU beds as well, we, we, we monitored those and you can see the Northern Cape had taken a lot of pressure around ICU beds given that they've had a sustained uh, uh, level of transmission for quite a while. Uh, but certainly Gauteng uh, uh, is showing high increases in the ICU beds. And as you know, this is an area where we don't have lots of beds because you require specialized staff and equipment to be able to respond to, to, to ICU type cases. On the oxygen side, this is a picture around the, uh, the oxygen supply and volumes. 
uh, the uh, um, during the, the the December January period, we had huge increases in oxygen consumption, as you can see on the graph. Uh, but certainly, we see increases in the oxygen consumption. We do have adequate quantities of bulk oxygen available. Uh, um, the the suppliers of oxygen are are aware of the uh, the increases in cases and are, are ready to respond uh, to be able to supply these oxygen uh, uh, supplies. In addition to that, we also have oxygen cylinders, and you can see uh, uh, significant increases as well in the in the uh, uh, supply of, of oxygen cylinders. We also monitor these. We need to turn these around so when oxygen cylinders are empty, they go back to the uh, uh, to the site to to be filled and sent back. And so uh, this becomes an important area to monitor as well. In terms of medicine availability, the minister mentioned this earlier. We use the stock visibility system, and you can see we monitor stock across the country. We use over 90% uh, uh, across facilities as green and between 80 to 90 as orange and then uh, red below 80%. You can see there's uh, two provinces that are falling below uh, between 70 and 80%. Um, they, they need to increase uh, their, their stock levels to make sure that uh, uh, as the, the numbers increase in those provinces, that they have ad adequate supplies of, of medicines to be able to respond. In addition, PPE, the minister mentioned this as well. We have uh, uh, all of the PPE that we would need uh, uh, monitored across the country. Generally, uh, there is very good availability across all of the provinces, just the Northwest here, that needs to increase some of its uh, PPE levels in order to be able to respond to this. But we monitor this on a weekly basis, try and support provinces to make sure that they get adequate stock uh, in, in anticipation of an increase in cases. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Manzi. I will stop there. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pillay, for detailing um, the surge response for us. I'd now like to invite uh, Dr. Nicholas Crisp to take us forward in terms of uh, the details of the rollout, uh, vaccine rollout strategy. Thank you very much, Dr. Crisp. Thank you very much, Dr. Manzi. Good day, ministers. Uh, Deputy Minister, DG, colleagues. Um, so what I'd like to uh, really just explain is that we have three major parallel streams for the vaccine rollout. And, and the minister has alluded to these in her opening speech, but just to try and provide a little bit more detail to each one of them. Those three streams include the general population stream, the essential workers and occupational health or workplace uh, services. The objective of all of these streams and of the vaccination program is twofold. One, to prevent severe illness and to therefore try and decongest uh, patients who are going into hospital. And the second one is to achieve herd immunity so that uh, in time we have enough people in the community vaccinated and immune so that we don't have continued spread of the virus. For the general population, the uh, uh, policy from the beginning has been to target age cohorts and the first age cohort was the 60 plus age group uh, from and our oldest person we vaccinated is 119 according to her ID document. So a lot of older people have already been vaccinated in this program but what we found is that only about 50 percent of the population in the 60 plus target group have actually registered and just over half of those have been reached so far with vaccinations. That program will continue uh, no matter what happens. And as the minister has just announced, we are going to open a further age category of 50 pluses because in some parts of the country, the a number of people 60 plus has already been fully vaccinated, whereas in others, we are still playing a bit of catch up. So the program has been running in the general community program for six weeks now. Uh, today is the, the end of the six weeks. During that time, we have uh, vaccinated 2 million people with the first dose Pfizer. And in the last two days, 100,000, just over 100,000 people with Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which, as you heard, arrived on uh, Thursday last week. Um, what's been interesting to monitor is that the registration of people on the EVDS system has been by far best in rural areas, not in urban areas. 
and uh, it's very dramatically best in uh, Limpopo, where over 75% of the population over 60 has registered on the EVDS system. Whereas in urban areas, we are still battling with some uh, areas below 35% registration. This is a bit counterintuitive because we would have expected that populations who have greater access to digital technology and bandwidth would have registered more easily. And we would have also thought that since we know that there's greater English literacy in the urban areas, that there would have been greater registration in those areas. This has not been the case. So nonetheless, we are trying to understand why that has happened. And we are busy at the moment loading five additional languages to try and see if, if it's a language barrier that is making it difficult for people to register. There are also, um, as the minister indicated, uh, registrations taking place at sites. And in urban areas, there's a particular drive to increase those registrations amongst this population. There will all, there's also been uh, assistance from the Department of Social Development and the Social Securities Agency that on pension days, together with a number of private companies, to assist the elderly to register and be vaccinated. And we're going to step up that program now with the pension payments in the coming month. So the average vaccination is, has got up to about 85,000 per day by the beginning of this week. And um, that, will, that will now increase because we've, uh, we now have a lot of vaccine that's arrived in the last couple of days, and we no longer have a resource-constrained environment. The methods of reaching the population over the age of 60 have been three or twofold, and the third one being introduced now. The first one is using our normal primary health care system using clinics and uh, other vaccination uh, facilities in the private sector, such as pharmacies and, and some of the private hospitals. There's also been a lot of emphasis on what we call congregate settings, where the staff of these facilities have been going to old age homes and vaccinating people in the old age homes. And there have been a limited number of outreaches to individuals who are bed bound at home but that is quite a difficult program to sustain uh, under the circumstances. Where we are moving to in the next uh, couple of weeks or within the next month is towards a number of mass vaccination sites in the metropolitan areas, and there's planning going on for how to roll those out at the moment. So as the minister announced from the 1st of July, the EVDS system will start accepting registrations for people over the age of 50, it will continue to accept over 60s as well, of course. Um, and as more age cohorts are opened in future, none of the previous cohorts are closed. They remain open. The target population or the total number of people, according to our Stats SA data in this age category of 50 to 59, is 4.8 million people. And we will be glad if we are able to reach 65% of that population, which means a target of 33 million people in, in that age category. The second big group, and as the Minister of D uh, Public Service and Administration has explained as well, is to reach essential workers. This started with the health workers, which would be an obvious place to start since we want to protect the health workers who are in the front line of caring for the rest of us if we get ill. And uh, that includes both professional health workers and the non-professionals who support the health workers. We did have some challenges in the beginning where the portal that was uh, uh, provided for health workers to continue to register was uh, abused and it became a, an open registration portal for the general public. So unfortunately, we had to close that and have opened a separate portal um, which is now available to any registered health professional and to uh, groups of non-professionals as we are able to load them uh, with a verification program uh, so that we can confirm that they are indeed healthcare workers. That portal will remain open and will be available so we can continue to register healthcare workers. As everybody knows by now, the basic education sector has commenced uh, with vaccination. And I'd like to, on behalf of our team to thank the basic education department for working so well with us. We're aware of a number of uh, glitches in getting going over the last two days, 
but um, generally it has gone remarkably well and the uptake by the education authorities has been, and, and staff has been fantastic. Since the uh, remaining 1.2 million short expiry doses arrived last night, as the minister announced, we uh, will get that cleared now over the next few days and by early next week, we will now definitely not have a vaccine constrained environment for the remainder of that program. It also means that we are able to start to introduce Johnson & Johnson vaccine into the general public program, which was not possible before because we had no pipeline to guarantee Johnson & Johnson vaccine going forward. The, the other sectors within the essential worker categories that are in advanced stages of planning, and this has been mentioned, is the police, correctional services, defense and justice and some work already on customs and excise, which includes uh, various government departments who work at border posts, and of course the staff of the Social Security Agency. All of those are, as the Minister of Public Service and Administration has explained, because they are public servants, are being managed by a program coordinated by DPSA with ourselves, with the services of GEMS and a number of service providers. And as each one of those programs is ready, they will start to roll out as well. We hope to get going with the first one during the first week of July. The third strategy is to um, address workplaces so that we can keep the economy rolling. And there are a number of major businesses where it's extremely difficult for workers to protect themselves with social distancing and, um, and to remain safe in the workplace. There are, there's a very long list of potential workplaces where the economies of scale are good and it's easy for them to uh, provide vaccination programs because they already have occupational health services. So we are going to capitalize on those workplaces, particularly in the mines, some large manufacturing plants, obviously transport with the taxi industry being uh, primary for, for us and also in tertiary education settings. So to do this, we will need to increase the number of sites, which is also now possible for us to plan because there are more vaccines in our, in our stock in the last week. And uh, both public and private sectors are gearing up rapidly. We have meetings twice a week with our key private sector players, and we are working together to work out which of the private sector sites can be brought online uh, more rapidly and in which areas. And the minute that that happens and there are more sites available, it means vaccination is more accessible to everybody. As I've mentioned, we have major partners from the Department of Health with the Department of Public Service and Administration, but also with the line departments such as correctional services, police and, uh, and the others that I've mentioned. We, one of the strategies which was not part of the uh, 60 plus strategy is to increase the number of uninsured people that we channel to private sector sites. In the beginning, we were sending uh, an uninsured population to the public sector sites, but the private sector sites rapidly um, sa satisfied the demand that was coming from insured population, and they have capabilities. So we are very grateful that we are able to now start diverting larger numbers of uninsured population to those sites. For, for vaccination. So in terms of the vaccination pipeline, it's been an extremely difficult start to the program because of the challenges we had with Johnson & Johnson and also because the numbers of vaccines that were coming into the Pfizer pipeline were relatively limited. But as I've indicated in the last week, both of these has opened up. The minister referred to the COVAX facility and those vaccines that are coming and the other Pfizer vaccines which have, have arrived recently, plus the 300,000 doses of Johnson & Johnson which came last week and the 1.2 million that arrived last night. Uh, once, they, once they land, vaccines go through a clearance process and um, have to be examined. The cold chain data is examined, plus some of the samples of those batches that arrive by laboratories at the National Control Laboratory. And it's only after that that they get released and that SAPRA authorizes that the labeling, labeling is sufficient uh, and correct according to what is required. And remember, we have these vaccines for emergency use, 
So the way in which they are accounted for is a little more stringent than one might normally do with, uh, with any other medical product. Nonetheless, it does take a few days for clearance before they actually enter the pipeline. And we try to keep seven days of vaccine in the pipeline so that if there's ever a problem with uh, deliveries or delayed flights or any other logistics hassles that happen, that we are still able to maintain that pipeline and never have to turn it off. Um, we do have a stock visibility system, the same one that Dr. Pele showed a moment ago, where we monitor the vaccines and the critical stocks, particularly in the public sector, the critical stocks. And all vaccine sites are reporting every day on what is remaining and what has been used so that we know where the vaccines are in, the, in that pipeline. Um, so right now, as of this week, both the, the Pfizer pipeline is uh, very stable until the end of July, and we know exactly what vaccines to expect for the, following, the next five to six weeks. The Johnson & Johnson pipeline is not yet confirmed. It's just these 1.5 million doses that we've received at the moment. We do not have a delivery schedule for the remainder. The 500,000 doses to make up the 2 million we were supposed to have uh, received when the, when the problems were identified in the US have uh, hopefully will be arriving in the next uh, the week to two weeks, but we don't have a delivery date for that yet. And we are still discussing with Johnson & Johnson the delivery pipeline for the weeks ahead. Nonetheless, we believe that has been restored and that their manufacturing is now back online. Once we have clarity on, on those deliveries, we will communicate in, in future press releases. So what we are doing at the moment between all of us in the public and the private sector, including the GEMS uh, that the Minister spoke about, is to increase the number of sites. And it's also making it possible for us to uh, do some outreach and particularly into rural areas, but also into some urban township areas. The target we've been able to sustain at the moment up to the beginning of this week was in the order of 85,000 uh, vaccinations being done per workday. Uh, that now we are able to do, and we have done uh, 100,000, just over 100,000 a day for the last two days. Our target for next week is to get up to 150,000 a day and by mid-July, 200,000 a day, with the target by the end of July, being able to have enough uh, resources in the field to do 250,000 vaccinations a day. The president has asked us to chase a target of 300,000 a day, and I think all of us in the vaccination response program are going to work hard to try and get to that point. So at the moment, and I'm, uh, I'll conclude with these comments, is that we have 3.75 million registrations of uh, 60 pluses, um, and, and there's a 2.5 million who have been vaccinated. That means that the queue for uh, the, the elderly people is still 1 million long. And that is partly a challenge because there are not sites in all the areas where these people reside, and it's very hard to get to them uh, until we open more sites. So clearly now that we are able to open a larger number of sites in a better geographical spread, we should be able to quickly reach the remaining people who we haven't been able to reach, while at the same time sustaining the current sites to accommodate the 50 pluses who are being brought into the vaccination schedule. So the good news is we know that for now we are not in a vaccine constrained environment anymore. The plans are rolling out quite quickly to increase the number of sites and the number of activities that are taking place in all three of these streams is now uh, rapidly coming to fruition. So I foresee that we'll be able to make a much better um, um, gains on our targets in the weeks ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nicholas Crisp, for that reassurance. And uh, also uh, from everything that you've said, I think it's important to say that everything that we do at the Department of Health is evidence-based. We do our research, we don't make assumptions, and we intervene on the evidence that is actually before us from sound research practice. Um, I'd now like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Professor Barry Shu 
Um, and Professor Shub, if we could just, we are kind of running out of, not running out of time, but uh, running a bit over. So if we could just really hone in on that New English, New England Journal of Medicine finding, and also um, the issues around the myocarditis in young men with Pfizer. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. It's your floor now. Thank you. Thank, <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Manzi. Um, honorable ministers, uh, honorable deputy minister, DG, all protocols observed. I'll just go quite quickly then through um, what the, uh, the acting minister touched on earlier. And that's it's quite a significant, interesting research finding, which has been reported very recently in the very prestigious New England Journal of Medicine. They actually did a, a very interesting study uh, in England. It was uh, piloted by the, the Public Health England, which is the, um, the public health body uh, in the UK. They looked at their registry and they looked at those individuals that had been infected uh, and those individuals that had been vaccinated and they matched the two up. And they looked at clusters of households and they kind of matched up where there would be an, a patient who had been vaccinated, the vast majority of over 90% with only one dose of the vaccine. And they looked at the rate of tr uh, transmission of the virus from a vaccinated individual who'd been infected to the household contacts. Um, I'll, I'll just summarize it in the interest of time. Uh, it, you know, when we go, and, and generally the, the household transmission rate is anything between about 16 to 18%. It's, it, the, obviously, there are wide intervals, anything from about 4 to 40%, but generally between 16 to 18%. What they found in this study is that the likelihood of transmission from a vaccinated person that had to be, that had been infected to trans to to the contacts inside the house was reduced by about 40 to 50 percent. Now, that's that's actually quite significant, and it's good and it's encouraging news, because really, if we look at what vaccine or vaccination hopes to achieve, it really looks at two things. It wants to achieve personal protection clearly, and uh, there's a lot of data to kind of support that. First of all, the risk of infection is quite uh, markedly reduced. And even those individuals that do get infected after being vaccinated, um, they usually have a very much milder and milder disease. But importantly, we also want to look at the ongoing transmission. In other words, people that are vaccinated who may get infected, do they transmit the virus? Now, clearly there is some transmission, but I think what this study does is it amplifies a lot of other previous studies which have shown that people that are vaccinated, even they do get infected, the amount of virus that they excrete is quite dramatically reduced. There is some transmission, and this is why we do advise people that have been vac vaccinated to still, they still have to obey all the precautions. But obviously once we get, as Dr. Chris mentioned earlier, a certain percentage of individuals that are vaccinated, we will stop the transmission, or we'll certainly reduce it to a point where it becomes not a great epidemic. So I think this is an important contributory finding to that, that vaccination does reduce onward transmission of the virus very significantly. Let me also go quickly on to the other topic, and that's the issue of myocarditis. It has received quite a bit of press coverage. Um, there are two countries which have really kind of studied this quite, quite extensively. Uh, the United States, which is up to now uh, immunized well, close on 180 million doses uh, of, uh, of the many of Pfizer and to some extent Moderna, which is very similar um, vaccine in that country to a less extent Johnson & Johnson. And uh, they've got uh, what's called a vaccine safety data link where they can look at any adverse events, any side, potential side effects uh, of the vaccine. And specifically looking at myocarditis after the Pfizer vaccine, um, of, the, of the 180 million doses, uh, they have so far picked up 600 reports of myocarditis. What myocarditis is it's the inflammation of the heart muscle. Um, and you pick it up, there's chest pain or shortness of breath or sensation of fluttering. Um, and of that 600, 309 were hospitalized and 295 of the 309 were discharged soon afterwards. So the bottom line, the vast majority, almost all were in fact mild mild disease, mild myocarditis. Mild myocarditis. Now, the interest, uh, it, that would translate to about 12.6 cases per million doses. So you can see it's extremely rare, uh, but it had been picked up. Uh, most of them were in males uh, between the ages of 12 to 39, 
but most of them, in fact, between the ages of about 12 and 20. So it affects mainly young or adolescent males, very rarely, and it's almost all of them have been mild. That's the one study. The other study, which uh, is uh, in Israel, where they've had a very extensive vaccine rollout, as, as we know, um, the world leaders in this, in this respect, they've immunized 5 million people, picked up 275 cases, 95% of them were mild, uh, spend not more than four days in hospital, and again, young males between 16 and 19 years of age. So the bottom line is myocarditis is a recognized side effect. It has been put in onto the FDA uh, sheet as a, a side effect which needs to be look, looked into, but it is extremely rare and it is mostly mild, almost all of them have been mild without any permanent side effects. Uh, Dr. Manzi, I'll leave it there because I, I realize we are a little bit short in time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shub. Uh, much appreciated. Um, now, um, uh, if we can just invite um, Ms. Milani Wilmerens to come through and just, uh, if you could just quickly take us through the interactive dashboard. And then thereafter, um, we would have invited uh, the Honourable Deputy Minister to close, but the Honourable Deputy Minister um, has an event of which um, he will elaborate. And so he has actually um, uh, requested that we ask him to come straight after uh, Ms. Wilmerans so that he can uh, be able to actually be excused and travel uh, to his destination. So um, <clears throat> uh, Ms. Wilmerans, please uh, take us through quickly the interactive dashboard, and then we'll invite the Deputy Minister to come through. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning, ministers, um, deputy minister, um, um, DG and, and colleagues. I'm quickly going to take you through the um, new dashboard that we have released on the SA Coronavirus website. Um, just a quick um, orientation. <clears throat> if you go to the SA Coronavirus website, you will see that um, it, there is um, different tabs that you can um, um, click on. You will click on the vaccine update um, tab. You will have a drop down, and then there's a drop down. Under the drop down, you're, you will select the latest vaccine statistics. And once you've done that. Um, my, my apologies, Ms. Womerans. I don't know if it's just me, but um, we cannot see the screen. We were just seeing a black screen. If you could maybe uh, stop sharing and reshare. Thank you. Apologies. So it's still not visible. It's visible now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll quickly just start again. So um, you'll go to the SA Coronavirus website, which um, with the URL, I think everybody knows it by now, SA Coronavirus, one word, .co.za. At the top um, on the landing page, you will have um, different tabs. Um, you would go to the tab that says vaccine updates there will be a drop down. Um, in the drop down, you would select latest vaccine statistics. And now, <laughs> okay, just a little bit slow. And then um, the dashboard will generate onto that. Um, I think it's just a little bit slow because of the internet. And then um, the dashboard, we, because we got, everybody wanted to know how many vaccinations did you do today? And up to now we reported um, tw 24 hours, um, um, there was a delay in 24 hours. The dashboard now would report the actual vaccinations that's recorded on the EVDS as at five o'clock every day. And um, so the cutoff date for the daily vaccinations is now five o'clock. And then um, it will be by the latest time that it will be um, updated live in the, in the, on the SA Coronavirus website um, is at half past six in the evening. So at half past six in the evening, the latest information will, will automatically be available on the SA Coronavirus website. And um, you don't have to wait for any press release, but it will be um, available directly after the update. 
the intention is that we move as we um, um, roll out the program that we move towards having <clears throat> the dashboard updated in the 24 hours <clears throat> we already received some questions to say what does this mean so what it basically mean is this is vaccinations that has happened one minute past five on the 23rd of june until five o'clock on the um, 24th of june and this afternoon we um, it will update and it will give us information that's one minute after five on the 24th of june until five o'clock on the 25th of june <clears throat> it just um, gives all this includes all vaccinations that has happened um since the start of um, um so, I'm sorry it's all the vaccinations that has happened yesterday um so it includes both j and j and pfizer so it's the total number of vaccinations that been has been administered in the last 24 hours so we're not distinguishing between the different um, um, programs and the different vaccinations. So this is everybody that received a jab in the arm um, yesterday per province. And then the next one next to it, just indication of the vaccinations that has happened in private facilities and vaccinations that has happened in public facilities. And these are total vaccinations for the day that has happened in the public um, facilities and um, total vaccinations that has happened in private facilities. <clears throat> At the bottom, you'll see there's then um, um, a scroller where you can go from page to page. Um, the next one is then giving a, a snapshot view of the total vaccinations thus far. So until um, five o'clock yesterday, um, the total vaccination, so the total number of people that has received a vaccine in 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 the country was 2.55 million um, 248, as announced by Minister um, earlier. And um, we all know the Sisonki program and um, the um, that was during the trial. You will see that the Sisonki program will also, the figures will change. Um, we are working on capturing paper-based records of individuals that were um, vaccinated during the Sisonki program. And then for the national um, vaccination program that started on the um, 17th of May, um, the total vaccinations is here at the top. And then um, it is then also disaggregated by province. And then you can also, um, it will just highlight the national figures or highlight the, the Sisonki figures for each one of the provinces. This graph will give an indication of the vaccinations over time. Um, so we will see that um, the pro-national program started on the 17th of June. And if you move, it will give you every day the, um, the the cumulative figures of vaccinations day on day. So at the top, you will see that um, if I hover with my mouse over it, it will give me 2 million and um, 2 million 70,478, which is the similar figure that we have at the top. <clears throat> and then similarly, we can also have the daily um, um, cumulative figures of vaccinations during the um, Sisonki trial. The next page is just um, giving a summary of the registrations. Similarly, it starts with, <clears throat> apologies, with um, the total number of registrations that has happened in the past 24 hours. And um, it's a similar principle of um, it's one minute past five um, on the 23rd of June until five o'clock on the 24th of June. Um, and this only reflects self and assisted registration. Um, like for an example, with the Department of Basic Education, we're working from a beneficiary database and we also have a similar or a different process for the occupational health stream. And this is just the total number of figures of individuals that has registered or that is, is has been assisted to register for the general population. And as of yesterday, we had a total of 23,748, of which um, 126 were um, addition to the healthcare workers. And the last one is then giving us just an indication of the registrations. So we can see that um, um, the gray line is the registrations of the healthcare workers, and the green line 
is then when we started with the um, um, over 60 population and um, that line has then incrementally grown over day and it gives us the cumulative figures um, daily of the individuals that has been registered um, for the 60 plus population. You will notice that um, yeah, we see some 60 plus um, registrations already from the beginning. So we include all 60 plus registrations within this graph. And then um, this just give us a disaggregation between healthcare workers and the 60 pluses, as well as per province. Um, and that's the start of a dashboard to give you more information. And we will um, continuously build on this as we move during the vaccination program. Thank you, Dr. Manzi. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wilmorans. Um, let us uh, invite the Honourable Deputy Minister of Health, Dr. Joe Parker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Manzi. Uh, let me pass my regards to colleagues, uh, Minister Kubayan Gubane and Minister um, Kunu, uh, and also uh, the panelists who have already uh, given us a lot of uh, very, uh, uh, very important information. Uh, I, I wish to join uh, Minister um, Kubayan Gubane in acknowledging the good work uh, partnership from the education sector. Uh, I think they've really led uh, uh, from the front and give a very good example. We want to thank uh, Minister Mutsecha and the team and, and also all the MECs and, and also the unions because part of the success of uh, this program has been the support of the, the uh, worker representatives. Um, I think it, it, it lays a very good foundation as already indicated by Dr. Crisp, that uh, uh, they are working very hard uh, with the other frontline uh, uh, sectors, including the security, the police, uh, the home affairs, uh, correctional services, justice, and, and, and all those, uh, including also in the private sector. We want to urge at this stage, uh, the work is going on very well on the education sector. Uh, we want to call on all the educators and the support staff who qualify uh, to make sure that indeed they are coming forward as scheduled uh, uh, because it's very important that uh, this is properly organized. So far, it, except for a few areas where there were a bit of a problems, uh, it's been very well organized. Um, we are aware that there have been in some few areas some hitches, um, sometimes in terms of uh, uh, in the independent uh, schools, uh, there have been some hitches in some of the provinces, but all that uh, we've been assured by the team that it, it is all uh, uh, being attended to. As already indicated uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Crisp, that um, our capacity is really improving in terms of the supply pipeline of the vaccines and uh, working together with our colleagues in the provinces we are therefore increasing the capacity to make sure that we can vaccinate more people uh, very speedily as, as the vaccine uh, uh, supply is improving. And indeed, we are hoping that by the end of July, we would have uh, surpassed that 200,000 and, and getting closer and closer as we go into August uh, to reach the target which has been set by the president. We want to say that um, uh, 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 people should continue to, to register, uh, as already indicated that uh, uh, from the 15th of, of uh, July, uh, we will be opening for, for the over 50s, 50 plus. But just to, again to emphasize that that does not mean that uh, those who have not yet registered, uh, those who are 60 plus should not continue to register. They, are, uh, uh, they will continue to be encouraged uh, to, to continue to register and come forward for, for vaccination. Um, the system is uh, improving the EVDS. We know that uh, there's been some complaints in, in, in a number of times, uh, long waiting times, a long queue, as indicated that uh, the scheduling uh, in some areas, it's, you know, it's moving quicker depending on the number of people on the virtual queue. But we want to also encourage that uh, where people have registered and if it's taking weeks and weeks and you don't get a, a message, uh, please approach your nearest uh, vaccination site to try and seek an, uh, an, an appointment uh, so that if they do have space in a number of areas, uh, people have been accommodated in terms of uh, almost 
a walk-in, uh, but especially if you're already registered, uh, if it takes, it takes uh, too long, uh, please uh, feel free to approach your nearest vaccination site so that you can be assisted. Um, uh, we, 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 we want to also just re-emphasize what uh, Prof. Shub has already mentioned, that uh, uh, as, as the vaccination uh, program uh, uh, is ramped up, let us all remember that uh, it doesn't mean that when you have been vaccinated, you should not use the non-pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, even when you have been vaccinated, because you can still transmit the, 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 vi the virus, we can also still get a mild infection. It is important to continue to use our masks and also all the other non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions. Uh, 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 Thank you very much. We're now coming to the question and answer session now. Colleagues, it's almost nine o'clock. We have really now gone over time. Um, there are quite a number of questions and with the uh, permission of the minister, if I may propose that the questions that are on the platform itself, maybe can be dealt with by the, pan by the panelists and they can respond uh, to those questions and they can respond to both the questioner and the panelists so that we can all have sight of those answers. Um, and then we concentrate on the questions that have come through from members of the media. I'm also going to request members of the media that quite a number of questions came through during the um, uh, presentations and, and a lot of the uh, questions have been covered actually uh, by the presentation. So I'm going to start from the back um, where uh, some of those questions uh, came in a little bit later which, were, which have not been covered by the presentations and then we'll move backwards. And uh, if you can just forgive us where we've covered, if you'll allow us to, to say, well, the, well, that area has been covered, the recording is, will be made available as, and, the, and the minister's address um, has actually already been posted. Um, so um, let us begin then. If it would the minister's, put, if we can go, uh, if we can do it like that. Um, now, is asking, is it possible that Harding only will be placed under a different lockdown level with additional restrictions than the rest of the country or will additional measures and restrictions apply to the entire country? Sophie Mukwena from SABC to the Acting Minister of Health. For her, she has three questions. Her first question is, many countries have reported a surge in numbers of COVID-19 cases that are
When is South Africa going to receive the vaccine consignment from COVAX? Third question, Strive Nasiwa, who is assisting Africa CDC to buy vaccines for Africa, has criticized COVAX, saying it has contributed to challenges of access to vaccines. What is your reaction? Um, then we have um, Vikas Berger again um, asking, uh, has the NCCC met yet to discuss moving the country to another lockdown level with additional restrictions and have the recommendations been made to cabinet yet? And can we expect an announcement on additional restrictions? Riante Pariachi from ETV News. Are people, uh, three questions also, are people who are awaiting a second Pfizer jab expected to wait for an SMS with a date, time, allocation, or will walk-ins be allowed once the 42-day th the period is up? Uh, the second question is, has the department looked into why how things COVID numbers are so exorbitantly high compared to other parts of the country? And the third question is, is the department considering if journalists uh, will be considered essential workers and will be eligible to get vaccinated anytime soon? I think, Minister, let me stop there with, with, with that set of questions um, and then we can move on after that. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, I think let me start with uh, the issues around whether we're going to move to other levels um, in terms of how in. We will present the report to NCCC on Tuesday um, in terms of what we've been able to observe um, based as well on in terms of the discussions with everyone that we have engaged with, verification and a decision will be taken by NCCC on what to be done. Uh, there's been lessons out of the previous uh, sessions that we have, or previous waves. So we'll take it from there. I think uh, I don't want to uh, actually almost say what is going to happen out of that. We've listened to the premier as well, where the issues around what they they would want to see in terms of housing and what they don't want to see. So we'll address next week after the entry to see in terms of what has been the decision. There's been a question about, uh, I think I'll, I'll start here. The issue here around how then, there's continuous work that is being done by NICD to understand the pandemic in the province. Yes, in terms of the analysis and the numbers that we are seeing, uh, more and more numbers, or in, uh, we're seeing an increased number in terms of the 19 year olds in that category, young people. Um, and I think sometimes it leads to the speculation that whether Delta Plus is already in, in the country and we are seeing that. There's not been evidence of that, but sequencing continues. Should there be enough evidence that says otherwise we'll be able to pronounce and, and be able to do. For now, we know that uh, what continues to be in our midst is um, the beta variant. Uh, we've not seen the Delta Plus in terms of how then specifically, but we are trying to understand the numbers. We've asked as well questions when we met with Houdin, for example, whether they are seeing uh, any trend in terms of behavior, in terms of what we are seeing in the numbers. Quite a number of issues that they, they gave us feedback, which we are hoping in the coming two days or three, we'll be able to support that with our work that is being done by the clinicians and, and the epidemiologists in terms of the work that is being done as well in term, from, from NICD, supported by that is whether it was one of the things they're raising, for example, is that you are seeing more and more simple things in families where somebody has passed away in the townships. You are seeing people still visiting the families in terms of uh, passing condolences. That's a total of so passing to do Those things are causing a problem because when you go and you start having one person that is visiting in those families, it causes social gatherings people think that if we are 10 we are 20 uh, it's not going to for example if you look at your people bar mamelodi atrechville harangua uh, all those the social are a problem because if 10 of you are gathering and then you leave and go into 10 families then it, it's spreading they have raised with us the issue of um, family gatherings which are a bit of a problem as well so we're looking at those data specifically so just to answer specifically we do not have clear scientific evidence that says there's a new variant. When we interacted with the team that is working, has told us that there isn't a variant. It could be a variant, it could be behavioral issue. So the issue of gatherings, and I want to go again in terms of 
What we are seeing, for example, in how they will continue, and this I raised with the NEC to request that the provincial leadership also look at the permits that they are giving for gatherings. We have matches that are continuously happening in the province, which is serious concern for us. I mean, if you have people are gathering continuously, match after match, I'm, I'm not so sure, even the issue around consequences. Because if the law does not permit for people to gather who are more than 100 outdoors, and somebody leads a gathering of more than 100, surely an example should be made. That person must be arrested. And that will send a strong message around compliance. And that's what we are appealing to law enforcement. And we'll take this message again as we go into our entropy, because we think that it will go a long way in assisting. Let me just say that the, the teams are raising concern to say even the 50 is too much, the 100 is too much in a surge in housing. For example, where you are finding if you have to trace 100 people, let's say out of that 100, 20 people are infected who times that with 10 who times that with it just becomes a huge number so that's why it's important to say when this numbers of the gatherings because we really really worried about these gatherings the permission that are given in terms of the matches uh, in terms of the gatherings uh, the previous day there was a gathering outside a court it's worrying to see such happening it's irresponsible of individuals who are leading these gatherings it's irresponsible of individuals who are attending these gatherings. So we really, really have to see the upping of the law enforcement agencies, but South Africans as well, and leaders taking a responsibility to say we are not going to compromise our followers. And that's why I need to be strong in this area, because we really appeal, please bear with our healthcare workers. They are really under pressure. Stop being irresponsible. And that's the message I'm saying as the acting minister of health. The other issue that Sophie raised is around what um, Strife Masiwa has raised. Masiwa, Masiwa was, has raised. Strife is an envoy of the president, um, President Ramaphosa. The principles that he's raising around equity of vaccine, availability of vaccines are what we associate ourselves with and what president has been clearly saying publicly to say it shouldn't be that we find access to vaccine um, being a difficult or a scarce com commodity for the countries which are developing and the poor countries. And those in terms of the issues, we associate ourselves. And I think the theme and the, what we are highlighted, we remain committed to our operating within COVAX uh, system and COVAX facility, but we do believe that there are a lot of issues that needs to be addressed for all of us to have access to vaccine, especially for the continent. He's been doing a great work in terms of mobilizing the resources. He knows the difficulties. I've interacted with him several times um, in terms of what needs to be done in supporting us as well as a country in his work as an envoy of the continent. So the work that has been done, South Africa does not isolate itself from the entire continent. We do believe that is important for us to continue operating in a collective while we also ensuring that we do as a country, sovereign country, going to source the vaccines ourselves so that we can be able to protect our nation. So that's important. And I think I, I have some, another question was around when is the NCCC meeting? It's meeting next week, Tuesday. As I said, we'll give the report. Um, so yeah, there's that. But mainly what is important was that I need to highlight to our citizen and also to the media. The first issue for me is that we need to remember why we're moving in terms of faces. In, 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 in vaccinating the nation. If we have the supply, and I'm linking to this discussion about what uh, uh, Strive has been saying and what the president has been saying, if we had availability of the vaccine, we would want to vaccinate everybody immediately. But we're working based on the schedule, as you hear. We have what needs to come now in the next quarter in July. And that's why we work on the phases because you need to, vaccinate as we receive. So the supply side remains a challenge. As we have the supply, if we have the supply in abundance um, and we are able to get it, and then we can vaccinate everybody. But in terms of the schedule of supply, that's how we are phasing out in terms of making sure that we vaccinate the population. So that's why we'll move with the 50 plus. It's almost around 4 million population. We're adding to the senior citizen 60 plus. Then we move into the next level 
in terms of availability based on the schedule. So once we finish, we are hoping if we move swiftly and the vaccine supply available, I think we should be able to say within uh, the IMC will consider whether in August we start with a, a 40 plus. We want to ensure our interest as government is to ensure that we vaccinate as many people as possible. We want to ensure that we protect even the front line. We want to make sure that we protect even the workers. I know there's been an issue around journalists as well. And as we've prioritized and we finalized this work, we've committed to the IMC that next week we'll go and detail a plan in terms of parallel, as Dr. Chris has said, but we want to make sure that all the sectors are covered and will be guided by both the MEC and the IMC to say, okay, this is the next phase that we are moving as we go in terms of those categories. I think I've been able to answer those. The last thing I think as well that I want to say, Luazi, just before even I conclude, we've been able to articulate what we are doing in terms of how to ensure and the reports that we are receiving on what phase is which vaccine application is. We want to appeal, can we not target the regulator? The systems that we've put in place as a country in terms of regulatory independence needs to remain so that we don't lose our credibility as a state. So politics aside, let's not use politics to influence regulators. Let's ensure that we work on the basis of information that is available. Applications must go in with the required information. It's not the regulator that does evaluation and collect data and runs trials. The applicants need to make sure that they submit the information as required by WHO to WHO to us as a country through the regulator so that we protect the citizens. I don't think any of us would want to be given a vaccine or a medicine of any sort that has not been tested in terms of its efficacy, in terms of its side effects. That's why we continuously communicate information that relates to the dangers if they are concerns about vaccine so that there's transparency. So that process is very important. It protects all of us, but it protects even the integrity of our systems. So the matches are not helping us in terms of putting pressure on regulators. It's not going to assist us. Let's make sure that what is required, what has been working, we provide the necessary applications that are needed with data that is needed for applications to be considered. And if approved, we can be able to use them effectively to the best interest of our nation. Thanks, Lozi. Thank you very much, Minister. Before we move on, Minister, I believe um, Minister Mkuno um, uh, has, has requested that he be excused. Um, there are no, there were no questions uh, for Minister Mkuno. So uh, through Minister, perhaps we can allow him to be excused. Yes, Lazi. Thank you very much, Minister Mtunu, for supporting us and joining us. Thank you, Minister. I think I think he I think he's he's uh, knocked off. Thank you so much. We can then move on. Um, we have a question. Um, from